everybody doing? Yeah, it's great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was flying to Atlanta. I was uh, attending a conference and meeting with some publishers up there. So we decided, since we were going up uh, for this conference, I decided to take a couple of our staff members with us. And so Pastor Mark came with me, and uh, George, you know George, who uh, is our worship leader, and then Steve. By the way, didn't Steve do a great job last week? Yeah. <laughs> Proud of him. Great job. And uh, so we had a noon flight, and just... For those of you that don't know, if you want to have a che- you know cheap flights, fly midday because most people are trying to get out in the morning, so midday flights are usually a little cheaper. So we flew at noon, and since we were getting there, I hadn't had breakfast, so we're getting there's about 12 o'clock. We're getting on the plane, and since airplane food is really an oxymoron, you know, up with like jumbo shrimp and government solution, um, I des- <laughs> I decided to pick up something to eat at the airport and then take it onto the plane. So we get to our gate. And there's a Nathan's Hot Dogs, and uh, which is probably not my first pick, but I'll take that over whatever they're serving on the plane. And so Steve, who spoke last week, um, I give him 20 bucks. And I said, listen, he gets in line with George, and I say, hey, listen, here's 20 bucks. I just want some nuggets. I don't want fries. I don't want to drink. I just want some nuggets. That's it. So he says, okay. And uh, I go over. Mark is at the little convenience area to get a Coke Zero because they don't serve Coke Zero on planes. Don't worry, I'm in the process of writing them a letter, but that should change things. But anyway, so I, uh, I grab my Coke Zero, and then uh, Steve is still getting the, he's still in line. So Mark and I get on the plane. Now, due to the hand of God's mysterious blessing, I get upgraded to first, Mark and I got upgraded to first class, and Steve and George were at the very last row of the plane. I mean, I think they were pedaling in the back. But anyway, so they're in the very last row. Mark and I are in the very front row. And so I settle into my seat as people are walking by. And you know the face that everybody makes when you get on the plane. You see the people that are, you expect like celebrities to be up in first class. And then they see, you know, me. And, uh, and the, the, the faces are like, why, why is he in first class? Uh, you know, he's no better than me. You know, that kind of face. And my face is like, I'm sorry you have to sit in the back with all the mutants. Uh, you know, that's, kind of, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'm really hungry. Steve and George finally get on the plane. And then Steve hands me my bag uh, of, of, of nuggets from Nathan's, and then he goes all the way to Siberia in the back of the plane. And uh, so, anyway, um, so the plane takes off, and I'm so hungry. I then open the bag. Uh, I open my box of nuggets, and there's only three nuggets inside. Three. Three lonely nuggets. And uh, so I spend the next hour and a half flying to Atlanta plotting Steve's demise. Uh, and I finally get to Atlanta. I'm, I get out, you know, we're in the front row, so we get out first. And then I'm waiting for him to get out. He finally gets out, and I'm like, dude, wh- why would you buy me three nuggets? I gave you 20 bucks. It's not like I shorted you. And he's like, oh, by the way, here's your change. Thank you for that. But the other thing is, is that why, why would you, do I look like a guy who only eats three nuggets? And then he's like, oh, I can't take another bite. You know, that's not how it works in my life. And, uh, and, and, and I said, but, and he's like, I don't know. I didn't know what you wanted. You just said nuggets. So I just got you the small nugget meal. I, let me, I said, see, let me ask you a question. What did you get yourself? <laughs> oh, I got myself the large order of nuggets. It was like 85 nuggets in the meal I got. Yeah. Uh, so I make a big thing about this. And then dinner rolls around. Uh, we get there. There's supposed to be like this meet and greet that we're supposed to be uh, part of. So we, just before we go to that, uh, it's probably about 6 o'clock, and, and there's this place in Atlanta. They're, uh, they're all over the place, but uh, there's this place in Atlanta called Zaxby's. Anybody heard, heard of Zaxby's? Yeah, what's up? Okay, so that place, Zaxby's is amazing, uh, and a couple of the guys, they had never been to Zaxby's, so I said, I'm like, hey, let's, we'll take them to Zaxby's. A lot like Chick-fil-A, except there's some, other, some differences, but it's, you know, mainly chicken, whatever. So, uh, but it's so good. So we all order our meals, and then we sit down, we pray, we're talking, and then I look over, Steve's ordered chicken strips. And I, and you know, we're talking a little more, and he's making a joke about the plane ride, and, and I'm like, you're joking about, anyway, so I just go, and I just grab two of his nuggets and eat them. Like, I take a bite out of each of them so he can't take them back, and I'm like, that's for my lunch. Uh, and, and so, anyway, then we all had a good laugh, and I appreciate Steve for being a good sport about it and not retaliating. Uh, because, you know, he'd have to update his resume. 
Uh, but, um, but, here's, but here's the thing that, here's the thing that happens is that, but I couldn't help but think about this, right? This is how conflict begins, right? Something happens, and it could be even, it could be accidental, right? In Steve's case, it could be accidental that he only bought me three nuggets. It could be. Uh, but then, here's what happens. Maybe something happens in your life. Maybe somebody says something. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say it that way. But you know what happens? It, when, when conflict begins, someone says something or does something or there's an inaction, and then we respond, and, and our response is intentional even if their initial action was unintentional. That then leads to the original person them retaliating or saying or doing something or not doing something that they're, that they're supposed to do. And then this leads, listen, now a serious conflict is in the works. Let me tell you about another conflict uh, that had a very different ending than the one I just told you about. It's 1914. Someone stops at a nugget. No, it has nothing to do with nuggets. Uh, 1914, a guy named Franz Ferdinand who is Austria's Archduke. Uh, he is in Bosnia, and uh, he's visiting Bosnia, and shots are fired from a crowd, killing him uh, and, and his wife. And because the person who killed uh, Franz Ferdinand uh, and his wife, Sophia, were uh, the, the, the guy who's said to have done it is a guy who was a, a Serbian revolutionary, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire decides to declare war on Serbia. Uh, Russia is bound by treaty with Serbia, so they then come to the aid of Serbia and they are forced to declare war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When Russia gets involved uh, in this, uh, with, the, with the Austro-Hungarians, the Germans, whom had, uh, they had a treaty, they declare war uh, on, now they declare war on Serbia uh, and, and the Russians. Once the, Rus once the Germans get involved, uh, the Russians called the French and the British who had a treaty with the Russians, and then once the French and the British get involved, then the Italians get involved on, on, on the other side. Now, if you're still following this, and you say, well, okay, I've got Serbia on one side, and the Austro-Hungarians on the other side, and then the Russians, and then the British, and the French are on one side, and then you have the, uh, the Serbians on that side, and then they've got the Germans, and they've got the Italians on that side. And this is, now, I, this, what I have just explained to you, if you're still following this, is how World War I got started. Random shots fired in a crowd, because they said one guy happened to be from some country, they declared war, and now we're off to the races. Because that's how conflict begins. There's just this never-ending escalation. And see, conflict, and maybe you've learned this in your life, like I've learned in my life, that conflict doesn't resolve by itself. Conflict only resolves when there is a peacemaker there to end it. That's why Jesus would say these words in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You see, if you're a person who wants real and lasting joy, you've got to learn how to reduce and how to resolve conflict. Because Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. And that really is the message of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. So I'm going to invite you to open to Philippians 2, if you would. And see, because... What he's going to show us is he's gotten to the crux of his message. He's given us the introduction. He's given us his prayer for us. And then he talks about, at the end of chapter 1, we looked at last time, he talked about us living a life worthy of the gospel. And now what he's going to do is really expound on that for the rest of this book. What does it mean to live a life worthy of the gospel? How to live a life with joy, which is what should epitomize the life of a Christian. And what he wants to do is show us the root of conflict and how to remedy it. Because listen, all of us have conflict in our lives. All of us have like a crazy person that we work with. We all have, unless you're the crazy person, which then that, I'm glad you're here too. Um, we all have, you know, like these Nazi type neighbors that are going nuts about something. We all have family members that we wish weren't related to us. Um, you know, or some make us wish we were adopted. Uh, there's, there's, you know, some of us, we have in-laws. Others of us have outlaws. And you've got all of these different types of people. And listen, there, it's not if you're going to have conflict in your life. It's when are you going to have conflict in your life. And how will you be able to reduce the conflict, resolve the conflict, and really neutralize conflict as much as you can uh, in, in your life? Because instead of waging war in our relationships, why not learn to resolve conflict and make the relationship stronger when, when the conflict is put to rest. And so what Paul's going to do is that he's going to give us three challenges 
and what we need to do if we want to resolve conflict, if we want to reduce conflict, if we want to neutralize conflict in our lives. So we're going to start in chapter 2 of Philippians in verse 1. Here's what we read. He says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or deceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And let each of you look, not, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, here's, I said there's three things I want to show you about uh, reducing and resolving conflict, here's the first one. And that's this, if you're a note taker. It's that I need to eliminate selfishness in my relationships. I need to eliminate it. Now, listen, I'm sorry to be the one to share this with you and, and give you this, but all of us are self-involved. Okay, all of us are self-involved. You know, you wake up thinking about yourself. I wake up thinking about myself. I'm always on my mind. And you're always on your mind, whether you realize it or not. Uh, and, and listen, we, this is just part of, you know, the sin nature that all of us has. Nobody actually taught us this. Uh, this is just like, it's innate in us. I, I have a 21-month-old daughter named Olivia who is the best. She's so much fun. But, you know, and she's, she's learning. She's, she's got um, a bunch of words under her belt that she's saying. But let me tell you two words that she can say real well. Uh, she can say no very well, and she can say the word mine with perfect diction. Uh, so there's, there's no, hey, what is she saying there? Is that mom or dad? What, no, but mine. She can, you know, uh, it, I mean, she can, she can say it, you know, she can say it. No, you don't know, it, it, there's no question as to what it is that she's saying. And so, why? Because there's just a selfish nature that, that's in each of us from birth. The other day, I'm telling you, uh, she wanted one of Xander's toys. Xander said no. She punched Xander in the head. Xander was tending to his wound. She grabbed the toy and then ran out of the room. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I, part of me is proud of you, and part of me is just like, you can't, that's not how we operate in a civilized society. Uh, and so, but listen, selfishness is one of the most destructive forces in any relationship. This is the number one reason, by the way, as to why marriages fall apart. People talk about, oh, we have irreconcilable differences. And here was what those differences are. I want my way all the time, and this person won't comply. That's pretty much how, 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 how it works. And it's because people just, they just don't, they don't get their way. And I'll, I'll talk to people and they'll say, you know, I got married because I wanted to be happy. I was talking about this at our couples retreat last week when I taught. They're like, I got married because I wanted to be happy. I'm like, what made you think getting married would make you happy? How many married, happy people have you met? Right? Well, I don't understand that, Pastor Bob. I mean, you're, you're happily married, right? Uh, I mean, I own an annual pass to Disney World, so that helps the happiness part. Because if you want to be happy, you should get an annual pass to Disney World. Uh, but, but I'll say this. Um, but, but, but Bob, seriously, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you happy in your marriage? Yes, I, I really am. I'm very happily married. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 16 years. In February, it'll be 17 years that we're married. But I'll tell you this. Thank you. Uh, I actually had to become unhappy before I became happy. So you, were, so you were unhappily married. Does your wife know about this? Well... She's not going to be very happy at this point in the message, but she'll be happier as it goes on. Now, but here's, here's what I mean. When, I, when we got married, I was completely, just completely self-absorbed. I was a, a, an extremely selfish person. And you know what I found? Maybe you found this too if you've been married for longer than, I don't know, like 12 minutes. Um, is that if you're, if you're just an extremely selfish person, this is not going to be a smooth ride uh, of, be, of being married. And so you know what I had to realize? One of the first revelations I had as a married man was how selfish I was and that I needed to change if I wanted to be happily married. And let me tell you something. Realizing that you're selfish and pretty much every thought that you have is probably wrong uh, because you're thinking everything is really about how do, how do you get what you want. Um, that, is a, that is a painful process. So it's like, are there happily married people? There's lots of happily married people. But in reality, is it probably takes being unhappy before, you're, before it is that, that, you, that you become happy because you've got to deal with all the selfishness and all the pride and all the junk in your life to then uh, to be happy. Um, and, and here's the thing. This is why what Paul says in, in Philippians 2, look at what he says in verse 3. 
He says this, and I, and I want you to see how he builds it up, right? And in verse 1, he goes, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and mercy, I mean, he's really mustering up. If there's anything that we talk about walking worthy of the gospel, walking worthy of Jesus, if there's any of that in your life, then here's what I would encourage you to do. Be like-minded. Be of one accord. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. And sometimes we'd be like, okay, that's cool, I'll do that. Now, here's the thing. I think some of us, like, we'll say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. I'll do that. We don't realize how hard that is. Now, think about this. Because it's very easy for us to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Now, I'm say, well, I'm not sure. Okay, let's, let's guys, let, I'm going to talk to the guys for a minute. Um, you come home from work, and here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, I would really like my evening to end with a little bit of romance. And so, all right, can we talk freely? All right, amongst friends. We've known each other for, what, like 15 minutes now? Um, and so now, so this is what you do. You get home, you want some romance, so you decide that, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to help bathe the kids, and, and you know, you're going to help your wife out. You're going to, you know, maybe clean the house a little bit. You're going to do the dishes after dinner. And then, now, you know, you start making your move, whatever your move is, and please keep that to yourself. Um, and then your, your spouse tells you, well, you know, the romance is going to have to wait until tomorrow. And then you get mad. And then you get an attitude. And then she says, well, what's your problem? And you said, you know, I did the dishes, I, I, I bathed the kids, I cleaned the house, and now nothing's going to happen. And then she says, is that the only reason that you spent time with your children and you cleaned the home in which you live in is because you had an ulterior motive? And you say, of course that's why I did it. You think I'm, I'm not cleaning to get the good housekeeping seal of approval here. You know, I'm trying to see something, make something happen. Now, of course, you don't actually say that unless you just got that, you got IQ problems, uh, because you say, of course not, baby. I live to help you. I love our kids, crazy kids. I love them. Uh, you know, and it's, it's my joy. It's my joy to vacuum. Oh, if I could only vacuum more. I wish my car had a vacuum cleaner. I could vacuum to work. You know, I mean, it, now here's the problem, right? Here's, here's the problem. The problem is, is that you did the right thing but you did it in the wrong way. You did it with the wrong motive. And this, you, so listen, we can do a very selfless thing for a very selfish reason. And that's the root of the problem. In fact, let me just, this is James chapter 4. Listen to what he says. It's so insightful. He says this. What causes the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have. But you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them. Yet you don't have what you want, you, you want because you don't ask God for it. And when you ask God, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what, you, what will give you pleasure. You see, selfish ambition, this whole idea of doing the right thing for the wrong reason, is deadly to relationships, and that's why it has to go. Because you cannot, listen, you cannot be happy this is going to sound counterintuitive. You cannot be happy in your relationship if your only goal is to make yourself happy in your relationship. And you say that, and you've you got to think about that a little bit, but it's true. If your goal is to make yourself happy, and that's all I do is to make myself happy, you actually won't be happy because you will implode your relationship. That's why Paul says, if you go in the next phrase, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. So then what do I do? Look at what he says. But in lowliness of mind... Let each esteem others better than himself. Now, let me, I love that because our natural tendency is to esteem ourselves better than other people. I mean, think about this. This is why you get upset when someone cuts you off on the road. Now, I know when someone cuts you off, you, you holler, oh, road safety, you know, and all this other stuff that means nothing to you. But in that moment, you're like, obey the law, road safety, arrive alive, click it or ticket. You're thinking all the, all, you know, whatever. Use sun pass, you know, whatever you can think of. Um, but it has nothing to do with any of that. Here's why we get upset when someone cuts us off on a road. It's because, listen, because someone else has esteemed themselves better than us. You know, I was, I, was driving, uh, I was driving home yesterday, and um, I had a guy. I had a guy. Um, I'm going straight. He's making a turn. He cuts me off. Then I get on the other lane, and he cuts me off again. And I'm thinking, I'm preaching on this tomorrow, so God bless you. You know? And, uh, and, and, and it, why? Because here's, here's, here's the, this is the, re the reality of what it is. Because this guy is thinking, where I have to go and where I have to be is much more important than anybody else. 
That's why it doesn't matter if I almost cause this guy to get into an accident. It doesn't matter if uh, I, I, I you know, scare the living daylights out of somebody else behind me. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Why? And, and, but listen, it's because he, these, we're, and when we do it, we're doing the same thing. We're esteeming ourselves better than other people. But you know what happens in relationships? When you esteem yourself better than others, you will destroy the relationship that you're in. You cannot rebuild, you cannot build it up or repair it. So if you've got to, if you want to eliminate conflict, and you want to reduce conflict and neutralize conflict, you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. You have to recognize if you've hurt someone and then take the steps to change it. You see, when someone says, well, that's just who I am, man, they're just going to have to deal with that. See, you know what you've said? You've said, I'm better than this other person, and they're just going to have to deal with me. That's, you know, now, uh, but that's not exactly what I said. No, that essentially is what you said. Because there's no reason, you're not going to budge. Why should I have to budge? No, no, no. This other person is going to have to change to accommodate me. And listen, that in its very root is pride. But you know what happens when you humble yourself? You bring life into your relationships. Listen to what uh, Paul would write in Romans chapter 12. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now here's why humility is so important. Here's why humility is so important in your relationships with others, why it's so important in your relationship with God, is because without humility, you will never actually obey God. You will always think you've got a better idea. Yeah, yeah, I know what God says, but I've got this other thing I've been working on. I've got this other thought that I think may actually have the same result or an even better result in half the time. And listen, the only way that you can really walk with God is to walk with him in humility. That's why when, in the book of Micah, there's this amazing exchange between Micah and God where Micah is asking these questions. And essentially he's saying this, in, in Micah chapter 6, he's saying, um, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? What is it that you want of me? What is it that you want of our people? What is it that you want of humanity? And then in verse 8, God responds to him. And I put it in your notes. It says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's where it begins. It begins with us having humility enough to say, okay, it, it can't be about me. If I want to neutralize conflict, there has to be a measure of humility in my life where I'm able to then humble myself and apologize if I need to apologize, make a change if I need to make a change. But there's something that goes even further than that. Look at verse 5 in Philippians 2 when he goes on. And he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now if you pause there and give me your attention, here's the second thing that you've got to do if you want to reduce, resolve, and neutralize conflict. Number two, I need to emulate Jesus in my actions. I need to emulate him. What, what do I mean by that? I, I love what Paul says. All of this has been the buildup. In these first few verses, he says, uh, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Consider others uh, better than yourself. Look out for the interests, not just your own interests, but the interests of others. And then he says, then he's giving us the illustration. And the illustration is Jesus. And he says that he was God, but he humbled himself and became a man. Now, this whole idea where it says that uh, it, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself. There's a theological term for that. It's a Greek word. It's, the Greek word is kenosis, uh, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And kenosis is this theological idea, which means the emptying. That is that Jesus emptied himself of some of his divine attributes to actually become human. Now, it doesn't mean that he was any less God. He was, he was fully God and fully man uh, in, in his incarnation. But let me explain what that means. Um, God is omnipresent, right? God is, uh, that is, God could be anywhere at any time. The psalmist in 139 said this. He said that the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, right? The heavens of heavens cannot contain who God is. And yet God limited himself to actually 
be contained inside of a human body. That's humility. To be anywhere at any time and then limit yourself to a human body. And it's like, well, I'd like to be over there. Well, I guess I'm going to have to get up and walk over there. And see, that, see, we don't think about the fact that becoming human is a humbling thing. Why? Because we're human. We think being human is pretty awesome. And we look around at the rest of life and we think, well, this is probably the best situation there is. You know, it's better than being anything else on the earth. But listen, when you are God who created everything and you limit yourself to becoming a person and not only doing it for yourself but for the sake of others, that you would actually, and he says that he became obedient to the point of death, that you would actually be so obedient that you would allow your creation to kill you and beat you to the point of death. I mean, that is the heart behind humility. That we would actually limit ourselves at times and not demand our own way for the sake of someone else. You see, too often we have that, well, that's just who I am and you're just going to have to deal with that. That is the antithesis of Jesus and Jesus' life and actions. Listen, What we do is when we demand our own way, here's what we're doing. We're hurting the relationship, and then we don't understand why there's a a conflict. You see, let me give you an example as to how sometimes this can can work. Um, In the Bible, there is nothing sinful about having a drink. Nothing. I mean, uh, the Bible says plenty about being drunk and that there's a sin in drunkenness. But uh, drinking was common in the culture of the Bible. So if someone says, I want to have a beer at dinner, I want to have a glass of wine, once again, there's nothing in the scriptures prohibiting that. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, this young pastor named Timothy is having all kinds of stomach problems. And Paul tells him, you know what you need to do? Stop just drinking water and, and take a little bit of wine, and it's going to help your stomach issues. So while there's a right, let me tell you what, what else is true. In America, one out of three people is either an alcoholic or is adversely affected by someone who suffers from alcoholism. And that is either they have a family member who's an alcoholic or a, a friend who's an alcoholic. So that freedom can make, can make someone stumble. Now let me tell you how, how it works in my life. Um, in, in my life, my, wife, my family and I, we can't really go out without seeing someone from church. And, and usually it's a great time to see someone say hello. Um, and, you know, uh, it's just a, and it's, it's good. And sometimes people don't even tell me. Uh, the they're from church. I was at Starbucks the other day. I ordered my drink, and then uh, I got it, and it said Bob on it. And I'm like, I never told her my name was Bob. Um, and but I just, like, all right, Pastor Bob, I'll see you later. I'm like, okay, we'll see you. Uh, you know, didn't realize that. And, uh, but I'll tell you, so here's what happens. Could you imagine I'm at a restaurant, and I'm having dinner with my family, and I decide, um, even because I have the freedom, and there's nothing scripturally against it, but I have the right and because I have this right and freedom to, I'm going ha- to slam back a Dos Equis with my dinner. Right? And then someone comes over, and I'm drinking it, you know, and then say, hey, Pastor Bob, is that you? Hey, what's, you know, what do you say? Stay thirsty, my friends. I mean, what else, you, besides that, I mean, what, what do you say? Right? And so what, what, what I prefer to do, what I prefer to do is, I'd, what I'd rather do is humble myself and limit some of the freedoms that I have for the sake of being able to continue to teach and lead God's people. And see, that, I think, is is, is part of it. And it's the same thing that happens in relationships. You say, no, 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 but I have a right. Yeah, I recognize that you have a right. But would it be better to limit your freedom for the sake of the relationship if the other person can't handle the freedom that you have? Let me tell you the way that Paul writes it in Romans 14. He says, then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve God with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. You see, the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking. It's about, another translation uh, in the New King James says, about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's about righteousness, doing the right things because we've been made right with God. 
about peace, that there, we have peace with God and we can have peace with others, and about joy in the Holy Spirit, experiencing the goodness of God in our lives. And listen, if we want to impact people's lives, there may be moments where we have to actually curb our freedom for the sake of ministering to them. If we, listen, if we want to reduce conflict, there may be a moment where we have to actually curb our freedom for the sake of there being harmony. And Jesus modeled this kind of humility for us. He showed us that conflict will come when we demand our rights instead of looking for opportunities to serve. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul would write, speaking of what love is and the, the activities of love, he says that love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude, and love does not demand its own way. Now let me tell you the fear that we have, and, and, and it's, it's a hard thing to talk about, but the, the fear that we have as, as, as a society and as individuals uh, with humility is that we don't want to appear weak. We just, well, man, if I, if I do that, then they're just going to walk all over me. That's the fear that we have. And so in our culture, all of us, we do everything we can to appear as strong as possible and to have it as much together as possible, even if it's not true. And this is pride at the core. Pride is to make everything in your life be about you. No, 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 I'm good. I don't need anything or anyone. I'm great. And see, this is the reality that most people don't want to hear. You, the thing about pride is that we think, well, what are they going to say about me? What are they going to think about me? You know what people are thinking about you? Not much. You know what people are thinking about me? Not that much. And I, and I see it, you know, I'm telling you, I had this happen the other day. Um, I saw some, I was at the store, and someone's like, oh, pastor, it's so good to see you. And I didn't really recognize them, but I, I love your messages, and I come to Calvary all the time, and they're, they're just going on and on. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. It's like, all right, Pastor John, I'll see you later. My, my name's not John. I'm a lot better looking than he is. And, <laughs> and uh, but, but I'm telling you, it's like this whole thing, and, the, and it's, but that, that's not, you know, my name's not John, you know, and this, this whole thing, right? And, but this is the whole thing. You think, oh, man, but people are thinking about me. Well, not really that much. They're not. And if they are thinking about you, they're thinking about it within the context of themselves, and then they're moving on. Uh, and that, and that's, that's, the, that's the reality of it is that, and let me tell you what happens in our lives, and let me explain it this way. I'll illustrate it and then explain it. Um, I, there, I, I, when I was in college, I used to um, have a, I was, had a job as a delivery guy, when I was in my, uh, I was in college, so I would, I would deliver food at night for this restaurant, and then I would uh, go to, I was in classes all day, and there was this kid that was amazed with my sense of direction, because this is before, like, GPS, nobody had cell phones, uh, whatever, I think I had just gotten a beeper at that time, uh, and so anyway, I had, uh, so the, we had a map on the wall of this restaurant. Like, all right, where are we going? And so you got here, and then you got to make a right and whatever. And so you kind of like in your mind picturing where you're supposed to go. But this guy was just amazed because, um, you know, he, he, he just worked in the restaurant, but he wanted, he, he, he was attracted to the high stakes life of the delivery guy. And he's like, you know, I'm like, you want to get in this game? You ready for this? Anyway, so, <laughs> so nobody really gets that. Uh, but so what happens is this, is that, I'm trying to explain. He's like, how do you know where to go? And I'm like, well, you see, this, this address that we're doing, and this is, you know, I, I spent all of high school in Coral Springs, and so I'm in college, and I've been in Coral Springs forever, so uh, when I was living there, and so I'm like, well, this is what you do. You're going to go up, you know, this road, and then you're going to make right, then you're going to make a left, and this and that, and you've got to go north. I'm like, so you see the address, you know you've got to go north. And so then he says, okay, but how do you know which way is north? I'm like, wow, okay, so we're really starting from zero. So... I actually, so I, I grab him by the shoulders, and I turn him, and I say, okay, that's north. And he says, oh, I get it. So everywhere I look is north. I'm like, no, that's not what, I, you are not, the, that would only be true if you were the very center of the universe, that everywhere you look would be north. But thankfully, you're not the center of the universe. But I'm realizing that that's what pride does. It causes us to think that we are the center of the universe, and every way that we look is the, is the right way. And you know what's amazing to me about, about pride is that pride is different than, than most other sins. Because most other sins, you can actually detect that you are doing them while you're doing them. Right? Pride is different. But, you know, no, no one is surprised to find out they're committing adultery. Whoa, you're not my wife? How did that happen? Right? Nobody's shocked by that. 
Nobody's surprised to find out they've stolen money. I don't know what happened. It must have fallen out of his account and into my account. How fortuitous. You know, right? Nobody, nobody's thinking that. Pride is very different. Pride is almost impossible to detect without God's help. It's almost, and that's why the psalmist would say this in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see, pride has this way of making us fools. Because the proud person cannot learn from his mistakes. Because they simply can't admit that they've made a mistake. That's why, I mean, a person filled with pride always makes poor choices. And then because they're so filled with pride, here's what they have to do. They have to actually then justify their decision as to why it's right and, and that won't admit they're wrong so that, of course, they just keep perpetuating the same bad decision over and over again. But there's something amazing that happens when we're willing to humble ourselves. And there's something amazing that God will do if we will humble ourselves. And that's why this, he goes on in verse 9 of Philippians, and here's what he says. This is where we close out this section. He says, Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now here's the last thing I want to tell you about uh, conflict resolution, and that is this. If you want to resolve conflict, here's what you have to do. You need to exalt Jesus' name in your life. You need to exalt Jesus' name in your life. And I want you to see what Paul says. He says, therefore. Therefore what? In light of Jesus' humility. In light of Jesus' work on the cross, that God did something. What did he do? He gave him the name that is above every name. Whether you realize it or not, the name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe. There is no other name that even compares to the power and fame of Jesus' name. And listen, you might say, well, my name has some power. Yeah, maybe everybody's name has some power. Everybody's name has some influence. When I was, I have a friend who wanted to attend the Bible college that I used to run. I ran a Bible college for four and a half years before uh, coming and starting Calvary. And so, but the registration period had passed. So when we left and started Calvary, my friend called me. He says, listen, I want to start, uh, I, I want to start the, the program at the college, but um, the, the uh, registration has passed. What should I do? I said, don't worry about it. Um, I called the director of the school, and I said, hey, man, uh, I have a friend, this and that. And I said, it's not a big deal. I hired him, so he's, I'm going to tell him that I need him to, to just, you know, let you to waive, you know, whatever, the, the cutoff, and that you'll be fine. So I call him up. Hey, man, it's Bob. I've got a friend. He missed the cutoff date. He wants to submit his application for the program. Oh, yeah, man, don't worry about it. Just tell him when he gets get to come to school, drop it off in person. Tell him uh, that, tell him that uh, you're, you're to call me. Tell him that you're, hey, I'm Bob's friend, and that we'll, we'll take care of it. Sure enough, gets there. Uh, I'm, hey, I want to submit my application. Oh, I'm sorry, the application period is, the deadline is over. Oh, but, but Bob Frank was called. Oh, let me call so-and-so, comes down. I'm like, whoa. And he's like, man, your name has some weight. I'm like, yeah, right there it has weight. See, and, and there's circles that Bob's name, my name has some weight, but you can't use that across the street at the gas station. I'm getting free gas in Bob's name. That ain't going to work. They're going to carry you away if you do that. It's not, right, everybody's name has some work, ha has some, some authority. And that's why when you think about this, right, have you ever thought about why we pray in Jesus' name? Sometimes we don't think about it. We think it's like a, some spiritual version of like 10-4, good buddy. You know, like it's just like, it's like your handle. It's what you say at the end. No, when we pray, whatever it is that we pray, here's what we're praying. We're praying, uh, and we pray all of these things in the authority of Jesus' name. Not in our authority. Not in God, I want you to do this because I deserve it. I want you to do this because I'm awesome. I want you to do this because I think it's a great idea. No, no, no. We don't deserve any of it. We're not, we're not good. But here's what we, here's what we say. We're doing all of this in the authority of the name of Jesus. That's why we pray. And that, that's why Jesus would say this. This is the last verse in John 15. He says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things you heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. You see, how much authority does Jesus' name have? 
in, in Philippians 2, in that last verse, here's what he says, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some of us because we know it to be true and others of us because they don't believe but they will have to recognize the fact because the name of Jesus has power. Listen, the name of Jesus has power to save your marriage. The name of Jesus has power to forgive you of the things that you're still carrying around, the things you feel guilty about, the things that you say, I pray that no one would ever find out about this. That's the thing that he has the power to forgive you of. He has the power to transform a human life. The name of Jesus is the power to heal people physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, spiritually. But here's what it takes. It takes coming to him. It takes laying aside pride and saying, well, no, 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 I, I, I've got it all together. No, you've got to lay that aside and realize that you're a broken person, just like I'm a broken person, that we are all a, bro- a broken people, and we need to come to him and lay down our pride. And when you come to him and you humble yourself, you find life. You know, when I think about my own story and coming to Jesus, this was the biggest challenge for me. I was in a band. I was on the verge of a record deal. It's probably the biggest band here in, in uh, all of South Florida. Every time we went and played a show, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people would show up. And my band was gaining more popularity. And, and here's the thing. The more people cared about my band and liked my band, the more I felt like I had value. The more I felt like I had worth. And here's what I had to learn that if I really wanted forgiveness, freedom, everything that Jesus offers, I had to lay all that aside. I couldn't find my worth and value and all that from, from there. I had to find worth, value, esteem, and my place in this world all in him. And that's what he offers to each of us. He offers to each of us this opportunity to find our worth, find our esteem, find our value, find our place in him. But it begins by laying aside this facade that says, no, 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 I'm okay, I got it all together. You don't have it all together. We don't have it all together. We need his help because we were created to know him. We were created to worship him. And that's where life begins. So let's pray together. And Lord, we wanna thank you. We thank you for that truth that you want to work in our lives. You want us to lay aside pride, selfish ambition, and instead to follow you because you humbled yourself and you died for us. And so now, Lord, we pray that that illustration, that example would be in us the work that you do that it would transform us from who we are to who you want us to become. That humility would be the medicine that relieves the pain that we've been feeling in our relationships, in our marriages, in our lives as we come to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. And we everybody said, amen. Now listen. Um, As we close, I just want to share a couple of things. And that is that I recognize that some of us might be here, and and here's what you're you're feeling. The conflict, that's what you're feeling. The pain of what's happened in, in your relationships, in your life, you're feeling it. And there's this part of you that says, I don't understand why things just can't go well. I don't understand why things just can't be better than they are. And every time I feel like I'm, I'm just, I'm going to get ahead, every time I feel like it's going to, it's really, go, it's going to happen, I just, I kind of hit the wall. And I think, man, the, my life's really going to be blessed, and I hit the wall. I feel like things are going to work out, and it's going to be blessed. I feel like I, feel, I found the person, and it's going to be blessed. I feel like my spouse and I have turned a corner, and then we just, we hit the wall, and I, and I just, I can't figure out why that is. And listen, I want to submit something to you today. What if that wall that you're hitting isn't a lack of ingenuity? It isn't a lack of your own talent or ability. What if that wall that you're hitting is actually God? What if that wall that you're, that you're hitting, what if that thing that you can't seem to break through is God who says, listen, we can't do this. We can't do it this way. 
What we've got to do is we've actually got to deal with the pride. We've got to actually uh, inject some humility so that you can actually go to even greater heights. So you can go to even uh, greater places than you thought in your life. But it starts with humility. It starts by removing the facade that says, no man, I got it all together, everything's good. No, 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 maybe it's not good. Maybe everything isn't okay. And maybe that's the, the point that God needs to bring us to at times. And I can tell you in my life, that's exactly what God had to do. To bring me to the point where I was almost at the top of the ladder and I realized that I was, it was leaning up against the wrong wall. And it wasn't everything that I hoped that would be and, and it was a total letdown until I realized that it was everything that God was using for me to come to Him. And could it be that that's the work that God wants to do in your life? So I'm gonna invite you to stand if you would. And here's what I want to do in these final moments. If you're here and you say, and I I really want to live a life that's blessed. I really want to experience everything that, that, that life has. I want to live a real and lasting life. Then here's where it begins. It begins in coming to God. It begins in humility. Saying, God, I need you and I need to be forgiven by you. Some of us, we're believers. And it's like, no, no, I've been a Christian for a long time. But we haven't been living that way. We've been living in a way that it's, it's a really about us. And we've been building this whole thing that, oh, everything's okay. Maybe everything's not okay. And this is the moment where God wants to do a work in your life. God wants to break you of that. You know why? Because there's this passage in the book of James where he says this. In verse 6, he says this. He says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if you say, I want to experience the grace of God in my life, I want to experience the grace of God in my marriage, in my career, in every part of my life, in my eternity, everything, I want to experience the grace of God, then here's what we have to do. We have to let go of the pride because God opposes pride. But you know what he does when we humble ourselves? He lavishes us with love. He lavishes us with grace. He lavishes us with mercy. He lavishes us with opportunity where he opens doors that we never thought could be open. We're able to go farther in one day than we thought would take 10 years. God is able to do that. But it begins by coming to him in humility. And so as we close, here's what we're gonna do. The band is gonna sing. And as they do, I wanna meet you right here. I want you to humble yourself and take a step and meet me here, and we're gonna pray together and call on God, and God's gonna work in your life. He's gonna transform your life. This one act of humility, God is gonna now give grace to the humble and do in your life things that you could never do and plan out and think of for yourself. He wants to do it in your life if you're willing to let him do it. So if you're ready and say, God, I need you, I need to come back to you, I need to take off the facade, and I need to just come to you humbly. If you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come and meet me here. George, lead us. Oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. To be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. And it's all, it is all because of you, Jesus.
want to read something to you. I read one part of the verse. I want to read um, a different part when uh, in the book of Micah, when God has this conversation with him, he uh, He say, keeps saying, God, what, what do you want? What do you want from me? And I want you to hear just what he says. Um, and he says this, he says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High God? Shall I offer him, shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give the fir my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? That's when he says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Listen, God wants to do According to the Bible, exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. If you've been here for a while, you, you know that I've shared this before, that, that your wildest dream doesn't even scrape the bottom of what God wants to do in your life. But it begins with humility. It begins by coming to Him and saying, God, I'm taking off the 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 facade that I've set up, I'm taking off the mask, and God, I'm just I'm I'm laying it out and saying, God, I'm a broken person but I know that you can do a work in me. And you can turn a life of brokenness into a mosaic, a picture of beauty that doesn't hide the brokenness. In fact, it accentuates it. But it says everything. You see a mosaic, it says everything about the artist and less about the art. That's what God wants to do in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray with these who have come forward. And I... Congratulate you, God bless you. I'm being courageous. And here's what I want to do. Um, if, you're, if you're still wrestling, listen, you can leave here the same way that you came in. But why would you want to do that? Why wouldn't you want God to just do a transformative work in your life starting right now? A work where he just shatters all the facades and all the stuff that we've been creating and instead begins to rebuild us and remold us and reshape us into something amazing that we might really know him and experience him and that he would go before us and fight our battles and do the work and open the doors that we can't open because if you can't open the door guess what God will smash down the wall to get you where he wants you to be that's the work he wants to do in your life, but it begins here. These steps that you guys have taken, I took the same steps. I walked the same walk when I had to humble myself before God and say, God, I need you. I've never admitted in my life that I needed anyone until I said that I needed him. And I still do. So I'm gonna pray, and then I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer watch God do a work in your life. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you for every person here who's come forward. And God, I just pray your blessings on them. And I pray that as they call out to you, Lord, in this holy moment, that you would act, that you would respond, and that you would just transform them in every way. And that this would be the day that they could mark on the calendar that today was the day that everything changed. Because today was the day that they laid it down. That they came to you and that you did a work that only you could do. Those of you that have come forward, I want to lead you in a prayer. Just repeat after me. But really, it's, it's a prayer of coming to God. For some of you, it might be a prayer of coming back to God. And I know this, that a prayer prayed in sincerity that God will hear answer and act and transform your life just out loud just pray Lord God I open my heart and invite you in to be my God to be my Savior 
to be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I've decided today to follow you, Jesus. From this day, I'm yours. I'm laying it down. Break down the walls. Break the facades. Because I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen.